Hey, this is Chris from Record Talk, and so today I'm going to do an episode about this big three ring binder that I have. If you're wondering what's inside this three ring binder, I have dozens and dozens of these CMJ compilation discs. If you don't know what that is, CMJ College Music Journal, New Music Monthly. Um, this was a magazine that was published in the 1990s, 2000s. Um, and one of the things they did was they included a uh, compilation CD in each issue of the magazine. So if you were a subscriber, you would get one of these compilations every month. And so I got the idea of making this video from Lisa Tedesco. I think somewhere in some live stream, we, I had mentioned this and she said, oh, you should make a video about that. That was a few months ago, and so I finally gotten around to actually making the video about it. So the CMJ compilation CDs live somewhere after the mixtape and before the playlist. Of course, they're not as organic as the tape that your friend or your lover would make for you, carefully picking songs or something that you might have curated yourself off the radio or off of uh, albums that you'd borrowed from other people. Now, of course, the record companies were trying to push new and not so new artists on those of us in the slacker, hipster wing of Generation X. So let's take a look at some of the stuff inside uh, here. So at the beginning, they came in these little cardboard slip covers. Eventually, they came more in like little like uh, paper sleeves or plastic bags. Um, and so this is the earliest one I have. Uh, number seven from February 1994. I have a pretty complete set of these from about 95 to about 2003 or so. Uh, the early ones are actually getting expensive to buy. And if, if, you, if you didn't keep them and you're trying to buy them off of somebody, and then the later ones just don't come up very much and are frankly of lesser interest to me. So for example, if we look at this February 1994, you can see, oh, Sarah McLaughlin, she's the very first person. So obviously she's somebody that a record company would have been pushing in the 90s. Richard Thompson would be obviously somebody older. Uh, you see Meat Puppets, Prong, uh, The Clash, again, were known. Uh, Michelle Nandeo Cello, of course, Jeff Buckley, uh, The Velt, I have a record of theirs. There's a shoegaze group. And... And you can see towards the end, there's even some cool stuff towards the end. Although these are probably the labels that weren't paying CMJ as much money. Uh, Alejandro Escovedo, Super Chunk, and Grenadine. Um, and of course, um, when I was listening to these back in the day, I was making a lot of discoveries of new groups. And so let me show you some examples of that. Um, so for example, here is volume 22 from june of 95 and i find these mid 90s ones with this sort of this dual color scheme and the colors would be different each month that's kind of what i associate with them so you can see dish and gene and then the third song Everclear, heroin girl season the risk come so you got a lot of like a lot of like um sort of commercially alternative rock being featured uh, later on, you've got like the Scud Mountain Boys at the end of the disc and all of that. But Everclear Heroin Girl, this was the very first Everclear song I ever heard. And I really liked it. I got their first album. I went to a show of theirs in Denver because I was living near Denver at the time. It was before they really broke. So I was probably standing five or ten feet away from Art Alexa Kiss at the small club that they were playing. Then, of course, the very next month, we have uh, July of 1995. So this would be volume 23. Soul Asylum, you've heard of them. They're the first ones on there. Gwen Mars, Engine 88, you probably don't remember them. Uh, Van Morrison, again, this is somebody obviously already well known. Uh, track number nine, Jennifer Trinan, Better Than Nothing. It's probably like her one notable song. She was somebody who I think a Boston area... Uh, singer songwriter she's been a lot bigger and then oh look there's number 10 there's that Alanis Morissette with you ought to know and so why is she so big I was never that much about 
I like I know the the song that broke her, the one where she, uh, Uncle Joey from Full House going down on him in the theater, la di da di da. But of all the female singer songwriters to become huge in the '90s, I don't really understand why it was Alanis Morissette. Um, so again, you can obviously see who is being pushed by the major labels, who is paying for the ads, who wasn't. Um, eventually, as we got later into the 90s, into the 2000s, we kind of got away from alternative. We got into like shitty post-grunge, shitty new metal bands, you know, those sort of new metal bands that would be most known for doing entrance themes for um, scrub professional wrestlers. Uh, of course, you can kind of track um, the career of somebody like Juliana Hatfield. So, um, CMJ number three, which I don't have from October 1993. Very first track, My Sister. Atlantic Records is pushing her pretty hard. Um, April of 1995, issue number 20, which I do have. You can see song number one is Elastica. They were very good. Song 2, Juliana Hatfield, Universal Heartbeat, PJ Harvey, Chris Whitley, Morphine, Royal Trucks, Jill Sabuel. Uh, this is a pretty, this was a pretty awesome issue, um, uh, version of this. Uh, you got like Medeski, Martin, and Wood later on down. And so, of course, then, um, uh, she... Um, she had that God's Foot record that never got released by Atlantic, so that never showed up on CMJ. If we get to issue number 65 from January 1999. So we've got a different color scheme at this point. These are harder to read. But buried about Midway in the Disc, number 10, Bad Day from her Bed album, Zoe Records, which was... Um, the alternative imprint of Rounder Records, uh, not as big of a deal. Uh, then um, subsequent records, she's not even on the CMJs until finally, and this happens to be the last CMJ I have, volume number 137 from January 2006, pretty boring generic. Um, track number four is Some Girls. So that's a group that Juliana Hatfield was in. Except I don't re remember this song, Dead in a Web, from the Some Girls record from 2006. And it's only 47 seconds long. And it turns out this is a hardcore punk band uh, from San Diego that Julian Hatfield was not a member of. Uh, they should have sued their asses and made them change their name to Some Girls Junior or Some Boys or something like that. Then, of course, the Queen of the CMJ CD comp was Ani DeFranco. So this is the one Ani DeFranco album, I Own Dilate, which came out late uh, 1996. Um, so the track Untouchable Face, which is on here, the first track on this album was also on, it was on a CMJ. She was on three different CMJs in 1997 alone. She was releasing a lot of, uh, she was pretty prolific on her own label. Uh, 98, 99, 2000, 2001, 2003, 2004. I have no fewer than nine Ani DeFranco songs just on these CMJ compilations. And I know that I think there's about three or four issues that I don't have that she also appeared on. So you can make an entire Ani DeFranco uh, compilation album just off of her College Music Journal appearances. Uh, and so uh, that was kind of a trip down memory lane for me about uh, the College Music Journal uh, compilations. Definitely discovered uh, a lot of cool music through them. Um, obviously, not everything on these were great. Some of there were obviously each CD would definitely have some duds on it. But that's sort of the nature of these compilations.